Hello folks, my name is Tim and welcome back to my channel. So in today's video, we're gonna be looking at these things. These are tiny little OLED display modules. They're pretty inexpensive and really, really useful. Now, you might wanna wire one of these things up to a project simply for the purposes of debugging, even if it's not gonna be a permanent part of the project long-term. So let's take a look at how you use a little OLED display like this with the Raspberry Pi Pico. These displays are built around the SSD1306 OLED display driver, and you can find its datasheet online. Now, this driver is a 128 by 64 pixel dot matrix style driver with the necessary display RAM and oscillator built in, making it very easy to use. However, displays built using it come in a number of sizes, and the ones I have here are only 128 by 32 pixels. And obviously, you can pick different size displays to suit your particular application. The SSD1306 runs on 3.3 volt logic natively, but most displays have an onboard regulator, making them compatible with both 5 volt and 3.3 volt microcontrollers. Though it's probably a good idea to confirm that this is true for your display before powering it up. Now, these displays come in two varieties, one using the SPI interface, and we've looked at how to use SPI previously, and one using the I2C interface, and again, we have also covered I2C in a previous video. Both types of display use the same controller, and the only difference is how you need to wire up the interface. A software driver is provided by MicroPython, and this supports both interface variants, so it doesn't really matter very much which one you're using. Today, I have the I2C version, and I'm wiring it up to the Pico's first I2C interface as follows. The SCL, or clock line, is connected to GPIO pin 17, physical pin 22. The SDA, or data line, is connected to GPIO pin 16, a physical pin 21. The ground connection is at physical pin 23 on the Pico, and finally, the VCC or voltage inline is connected to the Pico's 3.3 volt output at physical pin 36. And that's it. My dodgy soldering notwithstanding, this is a very simple module to wire up. So let's take a look at the software side of things. So the first thing we need is the SSD1306 driver, and you can find this in the MicroPython repository under drivers slash display, and I'll leave a link to this file in the description. To use it, just load it up in Thonny and go to Save As, then select the Pico and save the file as SSD1306.py. Okay, with the driver installed, let's look at a very simple demo. This program begins by importing the necessary modules to create the pin object and the I2C interface object. We then go ahead and import the driver that we just prepared. Now I'm using the I2C version of this display, so I'm importing SSD1306 underscore I2C. If I was using an SPI based display though, I would import SSD1306 underscore SPI. The same software package provides both drivers. So with our needed modules imported, we go ahead and define two variables. The first variable here, W, has 128 in it, and that's the width of our display. The second variable, H, has 32 in it, and that's the height of the display module that I'm using. Now obviously, if your display is a different size, you can change these values as needed. So with our width and height defined, we can go ahead and create the I2C interface object that we'll be using. So we do that here, and we say we'd like to use the first I2C interface. We're using pin 17 as our clock line, pin 16 as our data line, and we provided the desired frequency we'd like to operate at. Once we've created the I2C interface, we can then go ahead and use it to scan for our peripheral and retrieve the I2C address that it's been assigned. Right, with the I2C object created, the address retrieved, and the width and height defined, we can go ahead and build an instance of the SSD1306 I2C driver. And we're going to store that in a little variable called OLED. 
And that's all there is to setting up this program. Now, for the simple demo, we're just going to write out the text string Raspberry Pi Pico SSD1306. The driver uses an 8 pixel by 8 pixel monospace font for its characters, meaning we can fit at most 16 characters on a line. So the first function here just clears the display by setting all the pixels to black. We then write out the first half of our text because we can't fit it all into the width available. So we pass in to this text function the Raspberry Pi string that we want to render and we pass in an X and Y pixel position. Now this pixel position is relative to the top left hand side of the display. So we're basically saying please begin drawing text five pixels in from the left and five pixels down from the top. Then we'll need to make a second call to the text function to render the second part of our string and we're going to do that one line below. So here we say please draw 5 pixels in from the left and 15 pixels down from the top. These draw calls won't actually update the display immediately. These are basically buffered internally. In order to refresh the display, we need to call this dot show method here. Now when we call that, all the previous draw commands that we've made since the last time we called dot show will take effect and the screen will be updated. So we need to ensure that we call dot show every time we want to actually change what's displayed. Okay, so let's run this program now and see what our display looks like. All right, well, that's looking very good. So now that we have something on our display, let's play about a bit. Here I'm connecting up the little thumbstick that we first looked at in the ADC interface video. And you can refer back to that video if you would like to know more about how to use the Pico's ADC interface and this thumbstick in particular. Here I'm just wiring up the thumbstick to the ADC interface number one and number two. Okay, so with our thumbstick connected, let's take a look at this second demo program. Well, it's initialized exactly the same as the first, but this time we have two new ADC objects here for ADC interface one and two, and of course these have the axes of our thumbstick connected. We then have this little loop here, and this loop is basically querying the ADC interfaces to get back a value for the X and Y axis of the thumbstick. It then uses this little bit of maths here to convert the values from the range of the ADC interface into a range that fits within the dimensions of our display. So let's take a look at how this is done. Well, we get back a value from the ADC which ranges between 0 and 65,535. That's a 16-bit value. So if we divide that value by 65,535, we basically convert it into a value between 0 and 1 as a floating point. We can then use that 0 to 1 range as a multiplier or a scalar to a value here, which in this case is width minus 10. So if you imagine we get 65,535 back, that's the far extremity of the ADC interface. We divide that by 65,535 to get back 1. We then multiply the width minus 10 by 1, we get back well, the width minus 10. So when the thumbstick is all the way across on the x-axis, we'll get back a value which is equivalent to the full width of our display minus 10 pixels. Now that 10 pixel uh, subtraction is basically just to establish a margin. In fact, we're establishing a five pixel margin because if we have a value of zero from this calculation, we increase it by five so that we'll never go less than five. And we reduce the maximum width by 10 so that we end up accounting for the five pixels we add added and another five pixels to give us a five pixel boundary all the way around our display. And of course we're just going to do the same thing again for the y axis. So now as we move the thumbstick between the x and y maximum and minimum extents we should end up with positions that range between five and the full width or height minus ten. So 
Once we've got those positions, we can just blank our screen and then we write out a single character, and in this case I'm using an asterisk, and the position that we're going to place it at, well, that's going to be the x and y value that we just got back from the previous calculation. And then, of course, we need to call OLED.show in order to actually update the screen. So, if this is all working properly, we should be able to move this character around on the screen using our thumbstick. So, let's see if it works. Huh, well, that's certainly working nicely. Very good. So there you go. Hopefully you've been able to see that uh, these little modules are really, really easy to use and they're very handy little things to have knocking around in your parts box. So hopefully this has been interesting and maybe even helpful. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.